Good morning, Restoration family. So good to be back with you here today, and we're really excited to be getting back to live Shabbat gatherings where we can get together and worship together once again. So if you're in the Seattle area, we invite you to come hang with us on Saturday mornings at 1030. And however you connect with us through the internets, wherever you are in the world, we're really happy to have you here. Giving can be done through the Restoration app. If you're part of our Restoration family, you know how that works. And if you're not, I want to encourage you to tithe to whatever your local congregation is, wherever you are. And if you find yourself blessed by these messages of the work we're doing here in Seattle at Restoration, I encourage you to come be a part of that with us. As well. So wherever you are, however you got to us, we are really glad that you're here with us. And I want to talk today for a few minutes about perspective, which is how we see the world around us, how we perceive past and present events, and, and even how we view our own lives, and understanding that how we perceive things is important, because all too often our perception becomes our reality. The way that we see things becomes the way that we believe things are. And of course, perspective changes over time just, just naturally, through different seasons of life and, and different things that we go through. Sometimes things come along that can cause us to lose perspective and take our eyes off of what really matters in life, which is God. And so I want to start with this one simple question, which is, how would you characterize your life? If you were just talking to somebody at a party, if you were, if you were meeting someone new and they would just ask you to describe yourself in a couple sentences, what would you say? Would you talk about your career, family? things that you've accomplished in life? Would you talk, hopefully, about the future and your aspirations? Talk about past regrets and all the times you messed up, all the times you were done wrong by someone. And then let's take it one step further. If you had the opportunity to write your own epitaph, that, that inscription on your tombstone, what would you want it to say? How would you want to be remembered? How would you want that legacy? And I, and I find epitaphs really fascinating, how people choose to be remembered or how others choose to remember them, because it's one of those things that's quite literally right there carved in stone. So, for example, Martin Luther King's headstone in Atlanta reads, Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Of course, a line taken from his 1963 I Have a Dream speech in Washington. Ludolf von Kuhlen was a German mathematician in the late 16th century, the first person to calculate the value of pi to 35 decimal places. And so it seems kind of fitting that that's what he has inscribed on his tombstone. And then some people just have fun with it, like Rodney Dangerfield, there goes the neighborhood. But as a big fan of early American history, one of the ones that, that I like is Thomas Jefferson. He actually wrote his own epitaph before he died. And he also designed his tombstone and the house at Monticello that was right next to it, but, but I digress. <clears throat> anyway, Jefferson wrote his own epitaph. And what I find interesting is what he chooses to include and what he chooses not to include. So on his tomb, it reads, here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and the father of the University of Virginia. Jefferson led a full life, did a lot of different things. Governor of Virginia, Minister to France, Secretary of State, Vice President, President of the United States. None of these things appear on his tombstone. Rather, it was his creative work more than anything else that he wanted to be most remembered for. You know, it's funny, there's actually, there's an ancient Greek saying that I've always found kind of amusing, which is, count no man happy until he's dead. And there's this kind of dark humored side of me that just goes like, yup. <clears throat> but what, that, what that's really talking about is perspective. Because you can't know the full story until you get to the end. Because you don't have the proper perspective to make a judgment on it. Because when you're right in the thick of things, when you're right in the middle of everything, it's hard to get the full picture. It's like, it's like looking at a painting. When you stand so close that your nose is touching the canvas, all you can see is maybe a couple brush strokes. But the more that you step back, the more a picture is revealed, and the more you get to the point where you can see thing because you're looking at it from a different perspective. 
And when talking about historical events or events in our own lives, time and distance often helps us gain this perspective. So, for example, we seem to be nearing the end of this COVID pandemic, at least this phase of it, after nearly a year and a half. We don't yet know what the long-term impacts of this thing are going to be because we've spent the last year just trying to keep the lights on and figure out if we're supposed to hoard toilet paper or not going to be another year, 5, 10, 20 years as we look back at this moment in history with some perspective that we'll be able to see and understand the bigger picture, see the season in its context. And as believers, what gives us our perspective or what should give us our perspective in life is our faith that God is always at work, even when we don't always understand. Even when we can't see the bigger picture, we understand that there is a bigger picture and that he is ultimately full. That faith, then, is what gives us the strength to play our part in the story, even when we can't see the end. And your perspective will influence how you answer that question that we started with. How would you live life? I kind of like the NIV translation of Psalm 16, 8, which says, I will keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. But sometimes we do get shaken. There are things that we go through in life that if we're not careful could cause us to take our eyes off of God. We get lost in the tall weeds of our circumstances. We lose sight of the fact that there even is a bigger picture. So when God's promises don't come the way that we want, or at the time that we expect, that can throw us off, cause us to question. But when we allow ourselves to get stuck in the pain of past circumstances, we allow that to define us, when in reality, it's only God who can give us our identity. But when we spend all our, times, all our time comparing ourselves to other people, instead of focusing on the unique mission and calling that God has put on our lives. And these are things that we're all apt to deal with at some point in life. We all get shaken. We all lose perspective for a moment or a season. But what we don't want to do is stay there. We don't want to let it define us, thinking that it's always going to be this way. Truth is, your life is not a snapshot. It's a film strip. Wherever you are right now, that does not have to be where you end up. You are still breathing. There's a reason for it. Your story isn't over yet. And so it's in that context, kind of in that headspace, that I was in my own personal reading earlier this year, going through Genesis, and I came across this passage in Genesis 47. And it's a passage that's, that's kind of stuck right in the middle of the Joseph story, which I love for so many reasons. And, and so, I've, so I've read this passage over and over again, I don't know how many times, but for some reason, this time it stuck out to me in a way that it, that it hadn't quite before. And some of it is the translation I was reading. For Christmas last year, Katrina's parents got me this a translation of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, with literary commentary by Dr. Robert Alter who has been a professor of Hebrew and comparative literature at Berkeley since, I don't know, the earth cooled. And it's really quite a lovely set. And so I was reading earlier this year, and there's a scene in Genesis 47 involving the patriarch Jacob. Jacob, also known as Israel, the name that God gave him after wrestling with him all night. Jacob. Israel, the progenitor of an entire nation, and once his name enters human record, written record here in Genesis, it stays with us even to this day. In fact, when I, uh, when I were to say, if I were to say to you, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and you've already finished that sentence in your head, haven't you? Be honest now. That's the guy I'm talking about. He's He's kind of a big deal as well. So at this point in our story, Jacob is an old man. He's in Egypt with his 12 sons and their families, having left their homes in the land of Canaan, relocated to Egypt to escape a terrible thing. But one of his sons, Joseph, is now the viceroy of all of Egypt, 
second only to Pharaoh himself. And, and that's a whole other story in itself, but for our purposes right now, Joseph is taking his dad to meet his boss. And so let me just set the scene here for a minute, because here's the, here's the picture that I have in my head when I'm reading this. Big empty room. Everything white marble, really bright. Got those columns going down either side. At one end of the room, Pharaoh sits on his throne, all dressed up in full Egyptian regalia. On the other side of the room is Jacob, dressed more like the nomadic tribal chieftain. The shepherd in his robes, with his walking staff, which makes a distinct tapping sound on the marble floor. It's slow going, and Joseph has to assist him, partly because of his dad's old age and partly because Jacob walks with him. Finally, they enter. And I don't know if maybe you feel the significance of this moment, or maybe I just get like a geek out on these kinds of things. But here we have Jacob and Pharaoh, Israel and Egypt face to face. If this were a movie, this would be a climax moment. Israel and Egypt be like Rocky and Drago, mano a mano. It's a big moment in history. And here's what the text says, says in Genesis 47, starting with verse 7. It says, And Joseph brought, Fer brought Jacob his father and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Now let me just pause on that right there. Jacob blessed Pharaoh. You know, the Hebrew word here also has the simple meaning to greet, so it might also be translated that Jacob tossed a greeting at Pharaoh. But given the context here, it likely has a double meaning, meaning that Jacob, a mere Semitic herdsman, chief, indeed greeted and gave deference to Pharaoh as the head of the mighty Egyptian empire. But also that Jacob imparted some sort of blessing on Pharaoh personally. And I think in part, just, just narratively, it fits because of the role that blessings have played in Jacob's life. One of the first stories we have of Jacob is he and his mom conspiring to deceive his dad, Isaac, so Jacob could get the blessing reserved normally for the firstborn son, Jacob's wife, Esau. In fact, this, this deception so incensed Esau that he was ready to kill his younger brother, and Jacob had to flee his home and go stay with his uncle Laban in the north, a place called Padan Aram, which, Abars, I don't know if you realize this, but that is, is commonly associated with a town in present-day Turkey. So, you know, it works. But several times throughout his life, God appears to Jacob in dreams and visions and promises to bless Jacob, and that all the nations of the world would be blessed through Jacob, his descendants. Of course, there's the famous scene in Genesis 32 where Jacob physically wrestles with God through the night refuses to let go until God gives him a blessing. God did give him a blessing, and a cool new name, and a wound to his hip socket, and a permanent limp. And we know that from the text, one of the last things that old Israel did in his life was to bless his sons. So this theme of blessing we see woven throughout Jacob's life. And so now here, standing in front of the king of all Egypt, Jacob blessed. But here's the really cool part. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of my And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojournings are a hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have been the days and the years. And they have not attained the days of the years of my fathers in their days of sojourn. Jacob blessed Pharaoh once more and went out of his presence. In this brief conversation, Pharaoh essentially asked Jacob the same question that we started, which is, how would you characterize your life? And the words that Jacob used are telling because they give us a glimpse into his perception. Uh, to his perspective, his perception of his life. First, he uses the word sojourning, which again, probably carries some kind of double meaning. On the one hand, we're all kind of sojourning here. It's temporary dwelling between here and there. But also, if you look at Jacob's full biography, essentially the second half of Genesis, he hasn't exactly led a sedentary life. 
He didn't just work for GM for 40 years and retire with a gold watch. His whole life, as we have it in the text, has been a series of wandering, sojourning episodes. But it's that next part that really reached out and slapped me in the face this time. You and evil have been the days of the years of my life. They have not attained the days, the years of my father's journey. And it struck me because this doesn't seem to line up with the almost mythical, legendary image we can sometimes have of the patriarchs. Again, this is Jacob. This is Israel, the one who wrestled with God and man and won out. How is it that that guy, when Pharaoh goes, hey, tell me a little bit about yourself. Essentially, days, essentially says, my days have been few and evil, and I haven't really lived up to my dad's. I would argue that Jacob's issue here is a problem of perspective. See, somewhere along the line, Jacob allowed himself to get stuck in this circle get distracted and lose perspective, lose sight of the bigger picture of what God was doing in him and through him. And again, this isn't a Jacob problem. This is a human problem. This is something that we all are apt to struggle with from time to time. It's, it's something I struggle with from time to time. Because if we're just being real here for a minute, there are some times when I'm in my worst moments, I think, I'm 37 years old and I've done nothing with my life. I've wasted so much time chasing fleeting things, miles away from where I thought I'd be at this point, and what I'd be doing with my life, and nothing that I do really matters. Because look at what all these other people have been able to achieve, accomplish. But that's not true. I know that's not true. That's me losing perspective of all the ways that God has blessed me and losing sight of the calling that God has put on my life, not someone else's life or someone else's expectations, but mine. Maybe you have similar moments. Maybe you found yourself shaken, tempest-tossed, disoriented, and have lost perspective. So what I want to do is just take a, take a couple minutes and walk through some of the ways that we can find ourselves losing perspective, some of the things that happen that can shake us cause us to take our eyes off of most important. But the hope that when these things do happen, when we do go through these things, we can more easily recognize them, hopefully recenter ourselves a bit. So first of all, sometimes we can find our perspective shaken when God's promises don't come the way we expect or at the time that we want. As believers, I think it's a basic proposition that we believe God is faithful and keeps his promises. Right? I, I don't think there's a whole lot of argument. In that. But the problem comes is when we set expectations on what exactly that's going to look like. It's like we tell God what we want and when we want it and the way that we want it. And then we get mad when it doesn't happen. And God's like, well, I see where you're going with that and I like where your head's at. But here's how we're actually going to do it. And by the way, it's going to take like 20 years to get See, God made promises to Jacob the same way that he made promises to Isaac and Abraham before. God told Jacob that he would guard him, bless him, cause him to prosper. It just didn't look like Jacob might have expected. And I love the way that Dr. Alter in his commentary uh, describes this. And I, I kind of want to just read this passage in its entirety here. So, you and evil have been the days of the years of my life. Jacob's somber summary of his own life echoes with a kind of complex solemnity against all that we've seen him undergo. He has, after all, achieved everything he aspired to achieve. He got the birthright. He got the blessing. He got marriage with his beloved Rachel. Progeny. Wealth. But one measure of the profound moral realism of this story listen to this part, is that although he gets everything he wants, it's not in the way that he would have wanted, and the consequence is far more pain than contentment. From his early clashing with his twin in the womb, everything has been a struggle. He displaces his older brother, but at the price of fear and lingering guilt and long exile. 
he gets Rachel, the love of his life. But he does this only by having her sister Leah imposed on him too, and all the domestic strife that that entails. And he loses Rachel early in childbirth. He's given a new name by God, his divine adversary. But he comes away with a permanent wound. He gets a full solar year number of 12 sons, but there's enmity among them for which he is at least partly responsible. And he spends 22 years continually grieving over the loss of his favorite son from his favorite wife, who he believes is dead. This is, in sum, a story with a happy ending that withholds any simple feelings of happiness at the end. So Jacob got lost in his contentment he came with, even though from the outside it looked like. And that kind of segues us into number two. Sometimes we get stuck in that regret and that shame and that pain from the past. We lose sight of the larger picture, all the ways that God has blessed us. And God did bless Jacob. He kept his promise. In a way that, looking at his life from the outside, one might say, man, he's living the dream. He's got the job, he's got the girl, he's got money, he's got a nice house, a nice family. But it didn't look the way Jacob might have wanted it to. In some cases, it came to cost. So when he says few and evil, some translations will translate that as few and difficult, like NIV. Few and hard, like New Revised Standard Version. And we know from the story that Jacob has certainly lived a hard life. But the word in the original Hebrew is actually the same word used earlier in Genesis, describing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. And that fits too, because the fact is that Jacob's life has been surrounded by lies, deception, manipulation, and overall unhealthy family dynamics. We talked about how he deceived his father and his brother and had to run, but then later Jacob himself was dele deceived by his uncle Laban, his mother's brother, and tricked into marrying both the love of his life, Rachel, and her sister Leah. It causes all kinds of problems. Later, after Rachel dies, it says Jacob's son Reuben slept with Bilhah, Rachel's female servant, Jacob's concubine. Jacob heard about it, did nothing. Later, Jacob's daughter is raped, he knows about it, does nothing. He chastises his sons who do. Then, of course, Jacob's 11 sons conspire against their brother Joseph, the favorite son of the favorite wife. They sell him into slavery in Egypt, lie to their dad, telling him that he's dead. Jacob spends 20 some years grieving that loss. However, you want to translate this passage few and hard, few and difficult, few and evil Jacob did not have an evil. Things that he did, there are things that he should have done. There are things that he should not have done, times when he acted but didn't, times when he should have but didn't, and times when things were done to him. There's a lot of trauma in his past, a lot of regret. And there's this great line from the movie called The Shack where God is talking to this guy who's been through some truly unspeakable trauma. And God says to him, when all you can see is your pain, you lose sight of me. Take your eyes off of and you focus on pain and sorrow. And that's not to minimize pain and trauma. These things are real, and it's important to process through them, deal with them. The problem is when we let it consume us and define us to the point where it causes us to lose sight of the only one who actually gives us. And then number three, we can lose perspective when we're so busy comparing ourselves to other people instead of focusing on the unique mission and calling that God has placed on our lives. So when Jacob says, few and evil have been my days, and they have not attained the days of the years of my fathers, just mathematically speaking, he's right. Standing here before Pharaoh at 130 years old, Jacob has no way of knowing how much longer he has. And, and the way that he talks, it kind of gives the impression that he feels like he's already got one foot in the grave. And so he's not going to reach the age of either his dad Isaac, who according to the text lived to be 180, 
or his granddad Abraham, who lived to be 175. Reading into that comment, I think there's a little bit more to it. So when I read this, there's a part of me that reads it as, I haven't lived up to their example. I haven't lived up to their expectations. I have not lived up to their greatness. My life story has been different from this. He's comparing his story to someone else. And then getting upset when it doesn't matter. And this is a dangerous trap to fall into. And it's so easy to do, especially today with these little internet boxes where where we chase clicks and likes and thumb ups and where it's not even keeping up with the joneses across the street anymore it's keeping up with people around the world that we'll never even meet when we pour over everyone else's well curated timelines and then wonder why can't our lives be like we look at other people's wealth or their fitness or their family the awesome vacations that they go on or whatever the stuff is that they choose to display on the internet. And we think we must be doing something wrong. Pastor Stephen Furtick has a, has a great way of putting it where he says, the reason we struggle with insecurity is because we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. Curated stuff that they choose to put on the internet. And we know all the scraps and squabbles that happen at our house. Proverbs 14.30 puts it a little bit different when it says jealousy or envy. Cancer in the bones. We get so immersed in other people's lives and stories that we lose sight of the fact that God has given each one of us a unique calling. And instead of leaning into the adventure that is our lives, we spend all our time worrying about what someone else is doing. It's like I love the scene at the end of John's Gospel. When Yeshua and Peter are walking along the beach, and Yeshua is, frankly speaking, explaining to Peter how he's going to die. And Peter looks back behind him at the disciple whom Jesus loved, who was walking a little ways back. Peter looks back and, and says to Yeshua, yeah, but, but, but what about him? What about that guy? Yeshua's response is great. He says to Peter, what about him? What does that matter to you? Don't worry about that guy. You. And he might as well be saying the exact same thing to each and every one of us, too. Don't worry about what someone else is doing. You. Follow me. So maybe it's time for us to take our eyes off the screen. Quit looking at Exchangegram in my face, comparing ourselves to everyone else on the planet. Fix our eyes back on where they belong. And the one who created you, and the one who gives you meaning and purpose. In fact, the only one who can give you your identity, and the one who is especially fond of you. It's the way you are. So, Genesis 47 10 says, Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from Pharaoh's presence. And this is the last recorded interaction that we have in history of Israel and Egypt. He was standing there in front of the king of Egypt. Jacob had no way of knowing how much longer he had to live on this earth. And it turns out that none of us do. We know, according to the text, though, that Jacob lived another 17 years with his family in Egypt, in the land of Goshen. And it says that they took holdings in it, they were fruitful, and multiplied greatly. And Jacob lived to a good old age, he got to see his children, his grandchildren, and who knows, by this point, maybe even great great. And there's this really beautiful scene at near the end of his life in Genesis 48, I think shows how Jacob's perspective had changed since that meeting. Jacob is speaking with Joseph and Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Asa. And Jacob recalls his vision of God at Bethel all those years ago. How God told him that he would bless him and multiply him. And then it says, Jacob said to his son, essentially, I thought you were dead for so long. I thought I would never see your face again. Look, not only did God bring you back to me, but he let me see your sons. The next generation. Here at the end, Jacob had perspective to see a bigger picture. 
Jacob embraced them, kissed his grandkids, blessed Joseph's two sons, adopting them as his own. And one by one, he blessed each of his two sons. Then when Jacob was finished charging his sons, it says he drew his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. Which is reminiscent of the way that the passing of Abraham and Isaac is described, that, that they were gathered to their people, old and satisfied old and full of days. And Jacob was buried with his father and his grandfather, Hebron, in the cave that Abraham bought from Ephron the Hittite. Today, that, that cave still exists in a town called Hebron, about 30 miles south of Jerusalem, in what is today called the West Bank. And in that cave, Father and Isaac, Jacob was quite literally gathered to and that, to me, feels a long way from you and evil have been the day. And they haven't measured up to the to my life. The pain and the loss and the stuff that he suffered in life, it never stopped being part of his story. Even on his deathbed, he lamented one more time the early death of his mother, And he couldn't go back and change the past. He couldn't go back and be a better brother a better son. He couldn't be a better husband or a better dad. You can't go back and change the decisions you've made in the past. The only choice that you or me or any of us have, what are we going to do with the time that we have left? However much more time that is, whether it's 17 years, 17 days, or 17 minutes, what are you going to choose to do from this moment forward? You know, as we, as we kind of near the end of this, this season of COVID right now, there's a lot of talk right now about we got to get back to normal. We got to get things back to the way they used to be. And it occurred to me that maybe we're asking the wrong question. Maybe we're not necessarily supposed to go back to the way things used to be. Maybe for some of us, used to be sucked. Maybe instead we ask ourselves more importantly, maybe we ask God, what are we supposed to do from this moment on? What are the things that we need to take with us into this new season after this blip of a year? And what are the things that we need to leave behind so that we can move forward into whatever God has next in our life? Not the stuff. And so I'll, I'll end this here where we started with that same question. How would you characterize your life? We saw how Jacob did at point A, point B, and how that changed over time. What about you? Would you talk hopefully about the future? Would you talk about all your past regrets and all the times you messed up? Maybe take an opportunity in the next couple days to give it some thought. Write it down. It doesn't have to be long. Sentence, two sentences, a few words. And I think that the way that the way that you answer that question says about your perspective. Have you allowed yourself to get distracted? Take your eyes off of God, the one who created you and never leave you or forsake you. Maybe ask, how do you think God would characterize it? Maybe you need to realign your perspective. And as long as we're in some writing exercises here, why don't we try writing your own epitaph? You could write the inscription on your tombstone. What would you want it to say? Do you want it to say, you and evil were his day? You wanted to say he was gathered to his people, satisfied, bold enough. The good news is, you need to choose that. Right. Or as the prophets of MXPX put it, today didn't have to be this way. Tomorrow is another day. Another chance to make things right. A chance to fully live. Right, shall we? Lord, we thank you for this Shabbat. We thank you for giving us this time together. We thank you that you have sustained us through the season. Thank you that you have brought us back to a time where we can start meeting together and worshiping together again, even if that doesn't look like the way things used to be. Lord, we pray that you would be with those who are still sick and still suffering. You would fill them with your spirit, 
and you would bring the kind of healing that only Lord, we pray that you would be with each one of us this coming week. If there's some area of our life where we need a shift of perspective, reveal that. Show us. Help us to overcome any distractions that might cause us to lose perspective. Help us to refix our eyes on our true knowing. Love you. Grateful for the blessings that you give us this day and every day. Show his name. Thanks again for being with us. We are so excited to see you guys live again. Seeing you again.